So, hi everyone. Uh, there are some seats at the front. I won't be spitting or throwing any water at anybody, so don't worry about that. So I'm here to talk uh, about U-Boot, and I'll get straight into it. Um, <clears throat> I've got a slightly messy setup here because I've got these two screens, but we'll see how we go. So I'll briefly cover what is U-Boot. I'm assuming most of you know that uh, because otherwise you wouldn't have come. I'm going to talk about complexity in firmware, which I think is increasing, and how U-Boot can help with some of that. And obviously talk about some of the new things in U-Boot the last several years. Um, and I'll do a demo at the end, and uh, we'll see how that goes as well. So U-Boot is a, a universal bootloader. So kind of boot anything on anything is kind of the idea. It's been going for about 20 years. There's about 6,000 commits a year. There's quite a lot of active development, different architectures and so on. And there are four releases each year. It's got a, a lot of code, mostly in C. Uh, it's got some Python tools as well. And it's got a lot of similarity to Linux, if you're familiar with that. It's the uh, same code style. It uses kconfig. It, it also... Um, you can, it also has some compatibility layers, so you can port drivers over from Linux and subsystems over from Linux without too much pain. Um, and it has a CI that covers a large subset of the features. And in general, uh, U-Boot's on the forefront of embedded technology, firmware technology, largely because people are trying to get things done. They are using U-Boot, they're trying to figure out how to do it in U-Boot. So why is U-Boot so popular? It's largely the, the feature set, what it has in the features, but it's also easy to hack. It's pretty easy to get in there and, you know, add a new command for something or add some new feature for something. It's not, there are subsystems and layers and so on, but it's not out of control. And then, quite importantly, it's single threaded, there's no locking, it's not trying to be an operating system. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to work with. Uh, should be fairly open to new ideas and features, and it has a consistent release schedule. So let's talk about complexity. Uh, everything's getting more complex in this world. Even coming to Prague seems to be harder than it used to be. Uh, you know, the, the, everything, everything in our lives is becoming uh, more, more, more uh, electronic, more online, and the devices that we use to, to deal with that are all online and so on. The SOCs we use have a lot more features in them than they used to have, and they all need firmware. That firmware needs to be packaged somehow into an image, and again, that's getting more complicated. We've got security requirements and uh, you know, the, the difficulty of making sure that the code that we're running is the code we're supposed to be running. Um, you know, 10 years ago, that was less common. We also have the boot flow, which is now jumping through multiple projects, different binaries and so on, in order to get to an operating system. And finally, we have a proliferation of devices. So you buy a model, there are five other models that are similar but don't have quite the same features. So they have different firmware and so on. And how do you deal with that? And I'm just going to go through a couple of examples on, on this. First of all, SOC complexity. Now, uh, how many of you have heard of U-Boot's driver model? Yeah, okay, all right. So I'm not going to cover that in any other than just to say that it exists and it allows you to deal with this complexity fairly well. You know, you have a, a tree of devices, they can be in, in certain classes, uh, they, have a, they can have relationships, they can have private data, and a lot of that sort of stuff is dealt with for you, and device tree is used to pull it all together, so the, in the same way as done as on, uh, in Linux on, on ARM. Um, so here you've got a device tree, and here you've got uh, some devices in a Rockchip platform just showing you the list that you get when you're running U-Boot. Um, so uh, it's very, that's a very important part of this. <coughs> so um, one of the most complicated things is clocks. And if you look at the data sheet, they've even given up these days, I think, putting a clock tree diagram in them, but they used to, do, they used to have an attempt. Um, but the nice thing is with this driver model, you can just say, please give me the MMC device. It will go and set up the clocks that are needed to do that. It'll do the pin mark signals needed to set that up. Uh, it'll turn on any power domains that need to be turned on and you'll get the device. 
Now that's really, really complicated to do manually and hacking around on the data sheet and so on. You need the pin control drivers and power su uh, supply drivers and so on to be in there, but once they are, it works well. Uh, another, ex another example is configuration. So I, t I mentioned multiple models, lots of different models of different types. So with a uh, device tree, you essentially can say, well, the only difference in these, the code is the same, the U-boot is, is identical, the only difference is the device tree, because the device tree can set the configuration, it can set what devices are present and not present, and that sort of thing. So it's really powerful to be able to do that, because you can build, build your uh, firmware once and sort of inject the, de the device tree that you need, maybe even in the factory. And that's uh, fairly, um, <clears throat> fairly well uh, evolved at this point in U-Boot. Um, you can also pass configuration between confirm, uh, firmware components, and I'll mention that a little bit later. So just about packaging. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure if I went around each of you, if you're doing firmware packaging, you've got your own way of doing it. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. And it doesn't seem that difficult at the beginning, so you start sort of putting some scripts together and so on, and then you end up with this entire build system just related to packaging your firmware. Um, so Binman is an attempt, it's a, it's a, it's a part of U-Boot, but it is applicable to other projects. Um, we're using it with Zephyr, for example. It essentially lets you describe the image in a data format. So you can say, well, this thing has a, a, a uh, it's called uboot.rom, we run make image for this bit, we put SPL in it, we have the uboot image, and then, you know, this is just made up. But it gives you the idea, you know, it's basically a list of, of things that you want in the image. And the, the bin man basically just goes and pulls all the files in and produces this uh, image the way you want it. It also supports things like FIT and FIP and CBFS and things like that. So it can kind of generate these pieces and you end up with a, either a, a binary you can put on an EMMC or a spy flash or something like that. Um, the nice thing about having this data description is when you want to change it, it's very easy. You know, you just go and change this offset or you just go and add some new thing in here and run it again and, and you get a you can get a different image. Um, and the other thing is that you can actually look at it later. You can look at an image and you can see what's what's in the image rather than having to decode it with all sorts of um, random tools. It also deals with the other problem I find with uh, firmware is trying to find the tool that you need to sign it or to build it or whatever for each for each chip. Uh, so that's uh, done there too. So standard boot is an attempt uh, to to sort of make this make booting more standard in U-boot. So many of you be familiar with the boot m command, which is kind of how things have traditionally been done. There is a very powerful uh, format called flat image tree, which basically lets you you know specify a kernel, RAM disk, whatever it might be, or even firmware images, and uh, you know signature verification hashes and so on. But as to finding out what to actually boot and where on which media it's on and so on, people have traditionally relied on scripts for that. And there's been a thing called DistroBoot, which is basically a set of U-Boot uh, scripts that are built into U-Boot to handle that, which has been around for some years. So Standard Boot is aiming to add a higher level interface, essentially a way for U-Boot to really understand what is out there and what's available to boot. Um, so. There are three basic concepts. There's a boot dev, which is essentially a media device that can provide an operating system or, or something like that. So that could be uh, MMC or it could be USB. Um, but this, this is a device on top of those media devices. So it has different, uh, it has special things like, you know, please uh, let, me, let me scan you and things like that. Um, it also has a boot flow. Now, boot flow is just an operating system that you want to boot. And the purpose of a boot dev essentially is to provide a way, uh, provide some uh, boot flows, and they get, and the thing that finds them is a boot math. So these three things work together. It's a little bit hard to get your head around. But if you imagine that 
you have to, you have to go and hunt for these things in certain ways. Chrome OS is different from Android. It's different from, you know, from uh, Ubuntu, for example. And so you have boot methods for each of those, and then you can find what you need to boot. Um, so uh, I think that's a, it's a pretty simple uh, concept. It's it's super hard to get right, and that's it's still sort of. Um, still sort of in the, in the process of conversion. So U-Boot has quite a lot of uh, UEFI support. There's a, a UEFI layer in U-Boot, which is sort of distro friendly, um, and it can, it can boot these uh, distros essentially, which are EFI applications essentially. Um, and there's support for UEFI secure boot, capsule update, and, and so on. Um, because it uses the existing U-Boot drivers, it, you can just turn it on and it kind of works. You don't need to configure it in any way particularly. And there is a, a boot manager support in there as well. What you can see at the bottom is scanning for something to boot, finding this thing, and then, and then booting it. And this is using the EFI layer to do that. Um, and by the by, a U-Boot can also run as an EFI application, meaning that you boot into U-Boot from something else. But there is also this other thing going on called Verified Boot for Embedded VBE. So this is intending, for those of you who don't uh, wish to use UEFI, and I will point out a lot of embedded devices typically just boot into the operating system. They're not trying to be uh, Ubuntu and, and that kind of thing in, in, in Debian. So this is the attempt here is to say, well, if we're not going to use UEFI, what would it look like? Now, I did a talk about this um, last year. There were a couple of talks last year, so I'm not going to talk about it in any detail. But essentially, it tries to build on the existing technology that people are familiar with in U-Boot, like the FIT, and extend that so that the operating system can tell you what it needs before you jump to it. Um, essentially, at the moment, the way EF UEFI works is you jump to the operating system's stub, it then calls back to you to U-Boot constantly saying, tell me this, tell me this, give me this, and then eventually jumps on to, to boot Linux. And so the attempt here is to say, well, let's just describe in the data structure what we actually want, what the operating system actually wants. So we'll just do it. And then when it's done, we pass all that information on. Um, it's, I, I think, a potentially simpler um, approach. So we also have uh, documentation. So I guess many of you are familiar with Sphinx, which is what's, what U-Boot's moved to. Um, I guess there used to be a U-Boot manual many years ago, and it just sort of died. The good thing about this is it's part of the source code. So when you do a patch to add a new command, in that patch you add the documentation for the command, and hopefully the tests for the command as well. Uh, so that, that is a, uh, a departure perhaps from the way things used to be done. But the documentation is kind of pretty and it's kind of a text file so it's pretty easy to write and it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, and quite a bit of the uh, documentation has been converted. Um, I'll just mention that some, some of these slides have a little future bubble that just refers to something that is happening in the future indeterminate future. So the other thing is that's been expanded considerably in the last few years is testing and CI. So um, I don't know if any of you are going to any of these Zephyr talks, but there was one on emulators earlier today. Uh, U-Boot makes a lot of use of that. So. Um, you can kind of run U-Boot and uh, you can, uh, on, on your Linux workstation, essentially, and use SpyFlash uh, on it. And you're just really using an emulated SpyFlash. And there's a lot of that sort of thing. And it's great for tests, you know, because you can write these tests that, that, uh, that simply, uh, you know, that, that use these devices that are not really there. They just emulate it, but they're really fast and, and, and so on. And you can make the emulators do things that you, you want to test. So there's been a lot of use of that. This is showing a GitLab view of um, all these different things that are running. This has just started up. 
um, and, and you can run these tests. And so it's a, it's a sort of environment where if someone sends a patch and there's no test, you can say, hey, where's your test? And in most cases, it's not too difficult to write a test for it. Um, now, I mentioned this uh, earlier about device tree. One of the problems, though, is that Uboot adopted device tree roughly the same time as Linux, and the bindings don't always match, by which I mean that they use different properties and nodes and so on. So that's something that's being resolved um, over time. The other problem is Uboot has not been able to upstream its schema requirements to uh, essentially what was Linux, but that's changed as well. So um, so those we, there is now a DT schema thing and, and uh, some willingness to, to accept those patches. So it's definitely made a change to how we're thinking about device tree in Uboot. Um, the, uh, the idea though is essentially that you get the device tree from Linux and you can use it in Uboot. And so long as you've got the drivers and so on, you won't have all of them, you don't need all of them, then you can, uh, you can use that same device tree. And uh, there's also a live tree, which is a hierarchical data structure, and we're, we're seeing more usage of that as well. There's quite a number of minor things. Um, so uh, kconfig, uh, although Uboot has had kconfig since, I don't know, as long as I've been involved, perhaps 2014 or something, the... Um, there's still been a lot of these old config, hash defined configs in the header files and so on. So those are now gone as of I think earlier this year. And uh, essentially it's now possible to write a board implementation that doesn't have a config file because the text environment is, that the environment can now be in a text file, the default environment. So these are little, these are somewhat minor things perhaps, but it is, it is, uh, it is much nicer uh, than, it, than it used to be. Um, okay, so link time optimization, I presume you know what that is. It just makes your board take about four times as long to build, um, but it's 5% smaller or something like that. But it is a win, um, generally. So uh, it's, it's something that's almost turned on by default for ARM, I think, but it's, it's certainly working pretty well. Um, and then there's this thing called events. Um, so I, I'm not a huge fan of weak functions. Some of you may think they're wonderful and great get out of jail card. I don't like them very much because you can't really see where the call is ending up other than disassembling the code and putting a printf in or whatever, right? So events, basically you publish the event and then these other places will, will uh, receive the event and do something with it. Uh, and that can be done in a... Um, and you can see you can see the list of those spies they're called just by using a dumper tool. So they're not sort of they're easier to find than weak functions. Um, right. So another thing that's been going on behind the scenes is this idea of communicating between projects. Because if you've got these different phases of of Uboot and other projects. Uh, they, they currently kind of get built individually, they get configured individually, and it's kind of a pain because you have to do all that and make sure it's consistent, but they've got different configuration systems and so on. So one step towards improving that is a thing called the firmware handoff. And you can have a look at the link there. This is a specification for a simple sort of tagged data structure. You just have a tag and some, some data, essentially, uh, that is, can be specific to a project or can be shared between projects. And that, uh, I hope, will see us being able to say things like, right, well, you know, your SDRAM starts here, pass that through here. And this thing says, well, I want you to load here, and passes that through there and so on. So, you know, you can, you can uh, become, the firmware can become more cohesive. Even though it's built from different projects, it can sort of behave somewhat more intelligently than just blindly crashing when you do the, when you do the wrong thing. Um, so on networking, um, I guess there's quite, been quite a few changes here. There's TCP IP support and therefore WGET, which is kind of handy. Uh, TFTP is a bit more limited, uh, so it's good to have that. There's also IPv6 support. 
in a new uh, Network Fi uh, API. The other thing that's going on is there's been some big discussion about what to do in the future. Should, should the project move to uh, lightweight IP and using that, or, or should continue with its own network stack? So there's discussions about that, and that's fairly common in a lot of areas, right? Um, I think the MTD stack is, is straight out of Linux. On the RISC V and x86 side, there's boards arriving. Uh, booting distros on x86 is um, supported. We're pending some patches. And there have been some enhancements to core boot support. So essentially, one of the ways eBoot can be used is a, as a core boot payload on an x86 device. So you boot core boot, it starts up, it does everything including setting up ACPI tables and so on, and then it jumps into uBoot to actually boot the OS. And so that, um, that's become a little more polished now um, with the ability to boot, uh, find the UART without any trouble and that kind of thing. Tracing. Uh, right, so this is essentially tracing execution of your program. And the thing, the thing about booting is you want it to be fast, but you don't know why it's slow. And so tracing can help you figure that out. You essentially uh, turn it on, it records the start and entry of functions uh, in a memory area. You export that memory area over the network or whatever to your computer, and then you can run these tools to see what was actually going on. Uh, so this, is, uh, this, was, this has been in U-Boot for a long time, but was recently updated to support the new trace command interface, so, which is in common uh, with Linux. And uh, there's also a thing called boot stage, which has been in there forever. Um, which is, but that only really does timing. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't really allow you to debug it very easily. Now, another thing that seems really minor, but I called it out specifically is the cyclic subsystem. So I said that U-Boot is single threaded and, and doesn't have interrupts and so on, and that certainly makes it easy to work with. But it can be annoying because when you type, for example, USB scan, or USB start, um, you, you have to wait, you know, and it goes off and waits for the amount of time on each device that the spec says it has to and so on, and it can take several seconds if you've got a lot of ports. Um, it would be better if you just sort of said USB start and it would sort of do it in the background and, you know, maybe report them at the end or something like that. Um, and so that's something that's potentially possible with this because essentially what happens is whenever U-Boot is idle, it jumps into this cyclic, uh, schedule routine, and that is used for the watchdog, for resetting the watchdog, and that's been there forever. But now you can use it for other things as well. And uh, I've got some ideas there about what it could be used for, but I, I think I'm looking forward to seeing where that actually goes and what can be done with it. Another sort of, this is very sort of experimental and new, but there is a uh, a thing called Expo. So an Expo is essentially a set of screens that you can show to the user. And the, scenes are, the screens are called scenes. Um, there's always a, an attempt to avoid using words that are commonly in the code base. So that's if, if you're wondering why these names are so strong, are so strange, that's why. But the idea, essentially you can set up this uh, scene the user can interact with it, perhaps move on to the next one, and so on. And it's a little bit like uh, the BIOS menu in your um, in your x86 PC, for example. It's an attempt to provide something a bit like that. And it's, as I say, it's still under development and and so on. But you can see some of the elements of that in the code base today. So what I'm going to do now is. Uh, is attempt to do a little bit of a demo of some of these things. And uh, to, to some extent, uh, this is going to depend on how lucky I am and how patient you are. Um, but we'll, we'll see how we go. So what I'm, what I'm gonna do is I've got my little um, thing over there. That's not what I want. I want 
this thing. <gasps> okay. So I'm going to type things and see what happens. So this is me running um, QMU on a um, on a uboot.rom that I already built uh, to boot Ubuntu. And so you can see the screen come up there. Sorry, it's all sort of a bit over the top of each other, but you get the idea. And um, and there you can see. Oops, now I've now I've stuffed up my cursor. But there you can see it booting Ubuntu. I'm not going to let it actually boot. But that was the what you see on this display is it going off and hunting for these different devices, uh, doing a for, for boot flows essentially. It found this one. It's going to boot that boot flow, and that's obviously using the UEFI layer, and then it goes off and, and does the boot. So that's essentially what, uh, that, that's the, the uh, what do you call it, the um, standard boot working. And I can stop it and do this. So you can kind of see it. It got two boot flows, and if I list them, you can see them there and I can boot that boot zero or boot one or whatever. It was set up to boot just the first one. So that's the standard boot feature. Uh, you can see here the the method that was used, which is EFI, the state that it's in and, and so on, where it came from, boot.io. So that's, that's a little bit of a look at standard boot. Now, somehow or other, I need to get out of that. Uh, Oh, is it, is it QMU? Yeah, sorry. I get confused. Um, so that's that. And back over here, uh, I just want to show you the, the image that we are running there. So this is, this is a bit small. How am I going to make that bigger? So here we have a, an image. This is the uboot.rom that we were just running, and it's showing you the insides of the image with Binman. So this has been produced by Binman, so I can actually go and look at it and see what it contains. And I, while I'm here, I'll just show you uh, the tool situation. So I can look at the tools that are available that Binman knows about for building these images. I notice that this FIP tool is not present, this one. So I can do fetch missing. And it can see that uh, FIP tool is missing, so it goes off to trusted firmware, uh, downloads it, and now I can type FIP tool. So that's the, the intent of being able to actually use the uh, build the image firmware images really easily. And so to get your image into, firm, into Binman, you have to be able to provide the tool that people can actually use. So they don't have to go and hunt for it. Um, let me push this tree up to... Uh, up to the CI, and then I'll see if I can get that open. Um, so this is just showing you um, the the thing that's running now. This is a little bit small, as you can see. So I can make it smaller. But here it is running. It started it running these jobs and so on. And you can go in here and, and have a look at the things that it's doing and uh, get a feel for for what's going on. So if you're not familiar with GitLab, this is, this is GitLab. It's a bit like GitHub, but maybe more suitable for device devices and so on. So that's that. And what else was I going to do? I was going to show tracing, but what I'm going to do in the interest of time uh, is to show you something I, I collected here. Um, this is a, the flame graph that you can come in here and click on and you can kind of work your way around it um, and see different, see different things and you can see the call structure and so on. So it works pretty well. Um, the, the mechanism for actually uh, running the trace is essentially something like this. You, you run your boot, you uh, you look at the stats, and you can see that it's uh, 
it's already overflowed its buffer, but it's been recording it since we started. You then run this command to dump the call data out to RAM. This is all running in Sandbox, of course. And then you save that file out to, to your file system. And so now I've got a file which I can run uh, to convert to uh, you know, to, to the, with the prof tool, I essentially run to convert it to a flame graph or to whatever I want, and I can use trace command and so on. So, um, so that's the tracing side of it. And then the uh, the final thing I wanted to quickly show you was this um, this thing, and so I'm just going to run these little commands to convert the configuration over and I'll just run this sandbox and so this is um, essentially where is it no it's over here huh. this is just the configuration editor I was talking about so you can go in here and, and edit things it's just like a little user interface thing feature in, in UVU still under development so yeah that's 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 all I've got to talk about uh, so um, thank you for listening. And I guess we have a few minutes for questions, if uh, people have questions. How long would we have for questions? I should probably learn that myself. Finishes in 10 minutes. All right, so we have time. Does anyone have a question? Uh, this mic here is going to come to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. You mentioned at the start the direction to use a single U-boot and different device trees per board. Is it a future direction? Is there something I can do right now because of all the if devs and the weak, which I would assume would clash with this? Yes, you can do it now. Uh, it's been actually been around for a long time. In fact, um, back when Chrome OS was using this, uh, we had, you know, we, we, it was one of the early desires for getting into uh, to device tree. If your drivers, um, you know, if you're using the same drivers, it's super easy, uh, or if you can have a super set of them. Some of the drivers I see for an SOC will say, if it's this architecture, if it's this architecture, then yeah, you're going to have a you're going to have problems. But in general, it's it's uh, pretty easy to do, and it's been around for a while. Yeah. The reason I mention it is because it's becoming more relevant today than it was. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, yes, I wanted to know for the x86 uh, way of uh, booting. So I saw in the demo it's already working, like replacing a BIOS. Uh, but I was wondering if it, it can also work like a UFI image, like uh, by being loaded by the BIOS, like a, in, like sort of an iPixie. So do you mean UEFI on the computer booting into UVU? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes, you can do that. Uh, U-Boot can run either as a payload, where it sort of takes over the machine completely, or as an app, an EFI app. The app is less developed, the payload has been around for a long time. Um, so it depends what, what mode you want. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Down the back. You're just trying to make a run, aren't you? That's what it's all about. <laughs> uh, I have a few questions about the standard boot thing. Sure. The first one is, is it possible or maybe already implemented to set kind of priorities based on the device type? For example, a removable SD card should be booted first before internal EMMC, before a NAN flash, if all of those are present on the system. Yes, it has a priority system. At the moment, it starts with the, what it assumes to be fast devices. Each boot dev has a priority, um, and you can set that. It, so, yeah, the, the, slow, the last one is network. It'll always try that last. But when you say MMC removable versus non, 
I don't think it makes a distinction at the moment, so you would need to put that in there somehow. You can also hard code it. If you set the boot target's environment variable to the ones you want to try in order, it will do that. Okay, thanks. And uh, kind of related, would it make sense to implement something similar for the SPL? Because basically for now the SPL boot order is hard-coded into the device tree, like first try to load U boot from the same device and so on. And would it make sense to have some kind of boot flow or boot dev selection uh, enumerating all the storage devices present on the system and try to load U boot, the actual U boot payload from one of those per priority? Um. The nature of all, all bootloaders is they become operating systems. Uh, the nature of SPL is it becomes U-boot. Um, so, sure. Uh, there's actually a talk, I think, at this conference about putting the LCD display into SPL. Um, so, but standard boot is implemented entirely with driver model, and driver model can be turned on, or it is turned on generally in SPL, but you can simply enable drivers and they'll work. Um, it, it avoids using BSS and things like that that are a pain in, in SPL. So, yeah, I think if you really wanted to do it with some K-Config fiddling, yes, you could probably do that. <laughs> yeah. We have a question at the front. A what? A comment? Yeah. Oh. I'm coming. I'm oh. coming. Oh, hang on. <laughs> I have... I have but a comment. The SPL actually can iterate over a couple of boot methods already, so it's it's just there. Yes, that, that, I think we're talking here about the standard boot boot methods, but yeah, that's going to be confusing. But yes, that's right. It does. There's, you have a set of what are they called? Boot tar boot targets or something? I, I yeah. think boot targets. Yeah. Yeah. It's in common SPL SPL dot C. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. There is a weak function there. Oh, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can probably measure the number of weak functions. Yes. Sorry, I just have a thing about weak functions. Anything else? This is really outrageous what you're doing with all this running around. Well, <laughs> what do you suggest for runtime configuration for your boot to detect the hardware and, for example, choose between different device trees? So having the same binary running on different variants of the hardware, is there a standard uh, way to do this? Or? Well, the, if you think about it, the way Linux does it is you give it the correct device tree and U-Boot will choose that and pass it on. So the easy way to do it is in SPL, you choose the device tree you want and when you boot U-Boot, you give it that device tree and you can put them in, in a fit and essentially boot that. That's implemented today. Um, if you want to do something more clever than that, then you'd have to implement it yourself, I don't think. There is, there is actually a strange boot de uh, device tree selection thing right at the beginning of U-Boot proper, I think. Marek is nodding his head. Pardon? Oh yeah, DT, DT reselect, yes. So you kind of jump into U-Boot with a DT and then select a different one very early on. So you, you can actually do that as well, yeah. I mean, pretty much every, every case that anyone can imagine is someone has hit in real hardware and has tried to implement it in U-Boot. So it tends to be the case that these things end yeah. up being there. Can the same be applied to SPL? Because, for example, many boards as um, DRAM configuration in device tree and it's useful to switch between it one or the others directly by detecting the hardware and then choosing which device tree to use in SPR. Do you have the same thing or something like that or something working on that? So if you look at the Rockchip uh, 3288 boards, uh, the Chromebooks have that. They have a property in there which is the DDR config and there's four different ones I think for different DRAMs and it looks at, at runtime, it looks at the ID pins on the board to decide which one it is and uses it. So yeah, that's, um, that's implemented and you can do it here easily enough. Um, so we're just about out of time. Does anyone have a super quick question? Otherwise we're gonna wrap it up here. All right, well thanks, thanks for coming and really appreciate you listening. <laughs>